So uh, the outline of my presentation, uh, so we'll give you a little uh, and quick presentation of uh, our um, scientific park. And uh, as I mentioned, I will mention two projects. One is uh, called Macrosis on animal genomics, and the second one is called Rice Immunity as in plant genomics. And I will give you also some future prospects for the work that I will be carrying out, uh, particularly when, uh, with Vittorio here in, uh, in collaboration. So uh, I call it our PTP cluster a small area because, you know, being here, uh, it's much wider, you know, the kind of campus you have here. Uh, we uh, started off our um, activities around uh, six years ago. And as you can see, it's a combination, okay, of uh, uh, university. So we have the vet faculty and the agronomy faculty from Milan and uh, of uh, other institutes, research institutes, and uh, uh, some other activities which are concentrated here. So this one is the building where all the research activities are carried out. It's at 9,000 square meters. Very colorful, as you can see. And uh, so this one is a close-up. So as a description, uh, we are the center of excellence of the Lombardy region for the biotech applied to the agriculture sector. So all of us have something to do either with agriculture or food-related uh, aspects. So as, um, as you might know, you know, Lodi is located uh, south of Milan, and as I mentioned, we are tightly linked to university. Uh, so internally, we have a research center uh, where also my activities are carried out, and a bioincubator, uh, which is a, a place like here in area where we host you know, different uh, spin-off from university or um, small medium enterprises. And we also created a business park which is not active yet, but we hope you know, some, of, uh, some of these small enterprises will become successful and then uh, will develop their own uh, uh, business inside a business park. So our general mission is uh, to develop uh, innovative solutions uh, on the agriculture sector uh, to support Italy, uh, even if this moment is uh, very difficult also for research. And we also do a lot of tra technology transfer to small and medium enterprises. So I mentioned the business incubator. So uh, some of my work is also to uh, identify uh, new ideas, okay, and then uh, uh, develop uh, business plans, and then uh, verify market um, applicability or market prospects, do some economic feasibility, and then uh, try to help, you know, building up new codes. Uh, and presently, we have 15 new codes. Uh, you can uh, look at our website, and you might find uh, some are interesting because uh, uh, they're actually carrying out a link between the food and the nutrition. Okay, so this one is a, is a link that is becoming stronger and stronger, and uh, you might know maybe some of you are already working on this uh, in this field, which is called nutrigenomics and nutrigenetics. Where, as you as you might know, we study the relationship with uh, genetic uh, variants to, you know, habits or diseases. Okay, <clears throat> we also have an international cooperation aspect. Um, so we recently hired a, <coughs> a scientist working and, uh, in this field, and so we developed a, a number of research projects uh, with South countries, in, mainly in the food safety area, because as you know, you know, food safety is a very important uh, issue. Uh, other projects are more on rural development, and so we work mainly with uh, non-governmental organizations, and we also carry out uh, you in much wider um, scale here uh, junior scientist uh, research training. So the, the general mission in, in research, what we aim to, it's, uh, it's to carry out high-quality science. Uh, of course, high-quality science in, in the animal and plant sector. Um, in an international context uh, addressing basic and applied research. So I, I guess from what I know of ICGB, uh, we try to translate lots of our basic science uh, research activities into applied aspects. So it could be patents, could be diagnostic kits, uh, could be all sorts of other. I, I think you also have components towards more towards applications or towards market or um, maybe selling new ideas or know-how uh, to maybe pharmaceutical companies, okay? 
And so uh, internally, we have around 60 researchers, and we're divided in uh, two, se two areas, animal science, and we have uh, three different what we call sections, and plant science, uh, where we have a general plant genomics, and uh, I also created this unit when I joined around five years ago. Alongside the, the research labs, um, uh, who are mainly focusing on basic science research, we have uh, these four platforms. Uh, so those are central platforms, uh, supporting all the research activities uh, on uh, genomics, on proteomics, in chemistry, and in bioinformatics, okay? So all the research groups can benefit of these central facilities. Uh, so these central facilities run kind of service for internal users, uh, the research, the scientists, but also for external users, okay? Uh, via collaborative projects or outsourcing. So all of our work starts really from uh, a number of genome projects. Uh, we contributed to all the genome projects that I've indicated here. So we uh, contributed uh, sequencing and uh, annotating and uh, defining uh, some, of, some, of the, some of the plant, mainly uh, plant genomes, and also some of, some of the animal uh, genomes. Some of those were already published, and some others are, are, are now submitted or under completion. So it's really from, from this kind of information that we start most of our activities. And I will give you two examples and how we use this information to really try to understand, as I guess uh, you're doing here, you know, some of the mechanisms you know, be, behind some of the behaviors. And uh, we're mainly focusing on, uh, on diseases, you know, uh, sorting out and uh, try to identify solutions for uh, animal and plant diseases. So I just wanted to give you a, a little example of a uh, a project uh, which is a European project called Macrosys. You can find information if you're interested on, 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 these, uh, on this project uh, on the net. And so the, the scientist, uh, my colleague, Julietta Minozzi, she's uh, one of the heads of the animal genomics. She works on uh, uh, trying to understand the responses uh, in cattle to these uh, mycobacterium avium, so paratuberculosis, okay? So this uh, micro, uh, what we call MAP, okay, causes this uh, Jones disease. I don't know if you, if you know this disease. Anyway, causes a number of, uh, it affects uh, uh, the animal um, uh, quite consistently. Uh, this Jones disease uh, nowadays is non treatable. Vaccine, they're not so efficacious and uh, it's, it's a very costly disease for dairy production. And uh, today the host genetic components, they have very low heritability. So we, we, our challenge was, and the, the still ongoing challenge is to identify some of the genetic components, you know, behind the susceptibility to this disease, in trying to identify mechanisms of resistance. So the, the way we approached uh, this one a couple of years ago was uh, after the um, sequencing of the bovine genome, there were, you know, million of SNPs which were identified, which were polymorphic uh, in, a, in a certain uh, uh, population. So, uh, with, uh, in collaboration with Illumina, we, we developed uh, this 50K SNP chip. And what we did, we genotyped um, 100, 500 animals, which uh, uh, were cases of Jones disease and 500 controls. Okay? So, then we phenotyped all of these animals for a, for a number of, uh, of traits uh, uh, relating to productivity, relating to uh, immune response. Uh, relating also to, to their behavior, okay? So the, the aim of this work was to really localize regions and genes uh, which had an impact on uh, uh, Jones disease susceptibility. And also associated to that, once we would identify candidate genes, also identify the networks and the biological pathways, trying to, to then reconstruct and identify strategies to, to overcome uh, this, uh, this disease. So we used uh, kind of standard methods nowadays. You know, we, we carried out what we call the genome-wide association analysis, and uh, we used uh, genome-wide association using mixed models and regression, I guess, some of the bioinformaticians, I don't know if they're here, but, you know, these languages uh, should be, you know, kind of straightforward for them, maybe not so much for other type of scientists. And uh, uh, so we, we obtained uh, some, uh, some results that I will show you in a minute. And so the, the rationale was that we, we then identified areas which had um, significant association between specific phenotypes 
and specific genotypes. And then we looked at the genes which were within one megabase upstream and downstream of these regions, uh, identifying at least clusters of six uh, associated SNPs. <coughs> then we identify the, fun the put putative function of these genes and trying to understand <coughs> the network or pathways uh, to which these genes uh, belonged. So uh, as you know, genome-wide uh, uh, analysis, association analysis is, is represented by, by these kind of uh, uh, plots. Uh, and so the, the significance of uh, specific SNPs associated is given you know, by some biostatistical parameters. So th those, you know, it's a small set of SNPs which are tightly associated. Okay, in, in these specific uh, linkage groups, all of these are different linkage groups. Okay, so here are uh, some, of, some of the uh, tightly associated SNPs, uh, which are uh, candidate uh, areas uh, for us. So we, as, as I mentioned, we, we started to look at the genes subtending these, uh, these areas. And uh, we identified some, some of the genes which uh, um, made some sense in, in, in our biological system. So uh, all the genes in blue are actually in the areas uh, where we identified uh, significant association and also uh, they are uh, following into this uh, category. It's a general category. Antimicrobial responses, but also small molecule bi biochemistry, cell morphology, and of course, uh, some aspects of uh, cell death. So then we, st we started to, to then develop uh, what we call uh, you know, gene networks and uh, try to, to understand you know, some of the genes which were you know, putative genes involved in these responses and how you know, they were fitting in uh, known uh, signal transduction pathways or metabolic pathways. So we mainly worked on these um, antimicrobial responses, infection mechanisms, and cellular pro proliferation. And some of these data are actually coming from the human. Okay? So we tried to translate from all the human, the large body of human information, back to the animal uh, information. As we know, there are, of course, uh, lo lots of similarities between the immune response in the two systems. So this work, then, uh, uh, as I mentioned, was based on, on these uh, three main uh, uh, approaches. And now we identified some, some of the regions, some of the candidate genes that we're doing fine mapping, trying to really narrow down to very specific uh, uh, genes and gene functions. And also alongside that, all of our putative genes, we use them in an in vitro cell system um, where we do uh, kind of in vitro infection with a, with a mycobacterium and trying to really uh, pinpoint uh, uh, the most important ones and their type of regulation. At the moment, we're looking at transcriptional regulation. Uh, okay, so the, the second area uh, that I wanted to talk to is, of course, on rice genomics, which is the reason I'm also here collaborating with Vittorio. We're both working on the rice uh, system. So we created a five years ago this group, okay? And uh, here I've, I've just described our general vision uh, which is really what we, we aim in the long term to, to, to be able to do and really is to, to support the breeding programs. So, so how plants will, uh, will be uh, best performing in the field. So producing lots, lots of more rice with less diseases and uh, more what we call eco-sustainable approach. Okay, so we, our mission is, is really to use the available information. Of course, we don't use any GMO because our institute is not really pro as the whole Italian situation anyway. So we really try to use what is called biodiversity, so what is existing in nature, and really plugging in some of the molecular biology and genomics, um, which in rice are, are, are now uh, very, very well developed as a, now more than 50 genomes who are fully sequenced of uh, uh, 50 different varieties. So we can use all of this information and, uh, and exploit this information for our own uh, interest, scientific interest. So here I would like first to acknowledge uh, the scientists which were involved uh, in, in the activities and the, in the projects that I will, uh, I will present to you. Uh, so uh, our, our team is mainly of Italian scientists. Uh, uh, at the moment, uh, if now we have a Chinese colleague, a senior scientist in China, which, which is going to coordinate some of the activities. So the, the project that I wanted to mention to you, it's called Rice Immunity, and really aims at studying the molecular mechanisms of resistance to a fungal pathogen, which is called Magnapotha grisea. 
So this work has been carried out over the last three years in collaboration with a, a number of other institutions in Europe. So, uh, so the problem, the problem is uh, what we call the blast disease, okay? So the problem is really um, uh, depicted in this slide. So 70% of the Italian varieties, so the rice which is grown in Italy, is highly susceptible to, to this fungal pathogen. And so the, the real uh, phenotype that you see when the, the plant is attacked by this fungus, as uh, the name says, you know, it, the fungus is really blasting out of the leaves and then uh, it is really uh, destroying the leaf completely. And I will explain you why uh, this fungal, uh, fungus uh, works like that. So this one is a big problem, uh, the really applied aspect, because Italy is the main producer of rice in Europe. Okay? Well, Europe is not really producing lots of rice. We're producing just 0.5% uh, of the worldwide production. But for Italy, as you know, risotto, you know, we have, you know, we're, we're very much interested anyway. So, this, so anyway, so this, this one is the biggest uh, problem uh, in Italy. And in 2008, it destroyed 40% of the Italian production. So when it, when it comes out, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a major, major, major problem. So this, uh, this fungus uh, has a life cycle. So we, we can grow in, in vitro the, this fungus. So we know quite well. We, we already sequenced at least uh, 10 or 12 uh, different strains of the... So anyway, so there are spores which are transported by, by the wind, okay? And so they float in the air and then they land on the leaf surface and then they're able to germinate. But they just need some humidity and then they'll germinate. And then uh, they, they have a structure which is called a pressorium. Okay, so they're, they're able to, to really form a structure. They, they really adhere to the, to the leaf surface, so it would be very difficult. And then it's really using brutal force. So it's an osmotic pressure to really uh, go through the epidermal, uh, so the first layer, like our epidermis, okay? And then, uh, so this one is called biotrophic phase, okay? So what happens is it gets into the cell, and then it doesn't want to kill the cell. It just want to take all the nutrients, okay? So progressively, you know, it takes all the nutrients and the plant is kind of starving, okay? It doesn't have any more nutrients. And then cells try to collapse, okay? And then at that stage, it thinks, well, okay, now it's better to destroy everything. Then he enters the necrotrophic phase. It doesn't care anymore, okay? He says, oh, I have enough nutrients, I have enough spores. I've uh, already replicated myself. So it starts to, to, you know, it keeps going and uh, it keeps growing into, inside the cells. So it's an intracellular fungal pathogen. And then it bursts out, you know, of the leaf. And then it, it, it creates new spores, okay? So that's the reason when we, we look at the phenotype, okay? So here are small islands, you know, full of spores, okay? So you see the center and uh, all around is yellow. Yellow because the plant is deprived of all the nutrients. But then here in these areas, it activates also cell death mechanisms, you know, programmed cell death in the, uh, mechanisms. So the cells, you know, enter in a suicidal uh, kind of program. So we wanted to really to, to understand, you know, some of the mechanisms uh, behind, you know, these, uh, uh, these kind of events. And uh, the, the angle that we wanted to take, uh, so most of the scientific community started to understand uh, and uh, you know, to, to investigate really what we call host resistance. So really the, the strains which attack rice. So we decided a different approach. So we've taken strains which do not attack rice. They attack other cereals, you know, kind of wheat uh, or uh, sorghum, okay. So normally, and here is the example of this BR29, okay, rice is kind of immune, you know, to this. So the, we wanted to understand what really happens, you know, what kind of responses the plant activates. And, no, and then this one is the host pathogen, so okay, which is called FR13. So to this, the same variety, so the same plant is highly susceptible, okay? And then there are intermediate um, situations where we use other strains and we see in kind of intermediate response. Furthermore, there is also a response which is genotype dependent. So that means individual one, okay, is different from individual two. And this one is 
for example, more susceptible, okay, to these strains, and this one is more resistant, okay? So, of course, as, as expected, they behave differently. So we think that, for example, this guy is, is kind of immunodepressed. He's, you know, he's feeling, well, this fungus, okay, let it go, and then who cares? So this one will have a very low fitness, okay? So for us to understand also the modulation of these responses is it's also very important. So we developed an uh, in, um, in vitro control, let's say, where we use these uh, fungal spores, and uh, you know, within five days, you know, we can uh, uh, replicate what really happens in the field. So, so we, we have uh, methodologies where we infect in uh, growth chambers uh, these plants, and then uh, we let it grow, and then we look at the phenotypes, uh, look at the symptoms. So we can also take uh, 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 samples very early on after the inoculation, okay? So we, within, uh, within, say, uh, 20 days, uh, we can go from the seed to the result, okay? But then uh, the assay only lasts five days. Okay, so, so first we looked at a number of uh, cellular responses. Here I've, I've just put one example, okay? So uh, this, this one is kind of the spore which lands on the epidermal cell, which you see here. And then you have, uh, at that stage, you can have uh, different responses, okay? So normally you have no response, so the, the cell Okay, says, so, okay, you're there, I don't care. You, you, you're not really bothering me, okay? Well, then <clears throat> the cell says, well, and actually, this one is, again, the spore, and it tries to penetrate, and it says, well, actually, you're bothering me, and so I activate lots of cell death, okay? Then, then I stop you because you are a biotroph. You want to take all of my nutrients. So the plant says, well, I better stop you within that cell that you're trying to attack. So you're not attacking and not depriving the rest of the plant, okay? So this one is a, a normal kind of response that we have in plants, but also in other, in other animal and human systems, okay? So in, in, uh, in, the, in this case, okay, the, the kind of activation of cell death is more widespread, so it can spread to uh, neighboring cells. And in this case, is the case of susceptibility. So it's kind of difficult to see, but anyway, this, this one is our spore. It actually penetrates the cell, this one is kind of the immunodepressed guy, okay? So uh, the spore and then the fungus penetrates and make this intracellular hyphae, okay? So there is some local responses, okay? But, but actually, the, the, the cell is still alive, okay? So eventually, you know, these hyphae, well, they're just sucking all the nutrients, and then they will move out into other cells and continue, you know, depriving from all the nutrients. So this one is what happens in susceptible plants, okay? And this one eventually causes the symptoms. So we can quantify, you know, uh, um, taking these four classes, okay, w which were the responses to different strains, okay? And not surprisingly, we found that, for example, these strains, which is not adapted to rice, it's adapted to other species, it actually, in mo most of the cells, okay, nothing happens, okay? They're, they're kind of a type one. Whereas, for example, the host, which, you know, gives lesions, you know, most is, is this type four, okay? So most of the cells are, uh, are actually kind of uh, susceptible to these, uh, to, these, uh, to these strain. And then we have uh, intermediate situations, okay? So we, we're very much interested in understanding, you know, why then the plant, it actually in this case, you know, stops at actually the, ing the ingress, the attack, very early on. In such a way, it cannot even penetrate the cell, okay? And, uh, and actually there is, there is a lot of very little uh, cell death uh, activation. Well, in other cases, actually, the, the attack of the fungus is blocked, but then there is a massive cell death activation. So we really wanted to understand some of the basis of the innate immunity responses. Okay, so uh, a couple of years ago, we started you know, to do uh, some AFI arrays. There were these uh, 44K array, which is uh, kind of comprising most of the genes which are expressed in rice. Rice actually has more genes expressed than humans, okay? So, which is an interesting thing. But we have a lot of duplicated, uh, large duplicated gene families, uh, which also explains why the plants are able to withstand lots of stress, you know, biotic stress, abiotic stress, because as you know, plants, they cannot move. But actually, they can move a little, but they cannot walk. They cannot hide. So they have to be there and able to respond to so all sorts of different stimuli. Okay, so then uh, we, we inoculated, okay, with our system, 
We did, of course, you know, some biological replicates, and then we hybridized it to the AFI chip. Okay, so this one is our design. Okay, the design, as I mentioned, we have uh, different strains. We used one specific uh, uh, type, of, uh, type of plant, and then, of course, we checked uh, the symptoms, and then we took uh, RNA samples at very early stages because we wanted to, to, uh, to see what early on happens, of course. And so, uh, so then we did our microarray experiments. <clears throat> so here we've taken three biological replicates, what you see. So the mock inoculated, that means we just sprayed on the leaf, you know, some gelatin or some water. And then those, those are, you know, our four different uh, strains. One which is, means it's uh, fully susceptible, the plant. So the plant let the fungus grow inside, okay? Uh, the CL367 is actually another strain to which that specific plant responds activating cell death, okay? So it activates cell death and then is able to block the fungus before it gets you know, infected uh, the rest of the cells around. And then BR29 is actually that strain uh, which uh, blocks very early on, you know, the ingress and the attack of the fungus. And BR32 is kind of intermediate. So that fits also on, you know, on the whole transcriptome analysis because, as you can see, uh, in, in this case, you know, there is a big cluster of genes which are kind of activated and actually here downregulated. Okay? So it's interesting because uh, the cell really globally responds very differently. Okay? And as you can see from this little clustering analysis, which was uh, <clears throat> very reassuring for us, the three biological replicates actually stay together because it was a bit worrying that because there is a lot of biological variability if, uh, you know, these replicates would, would not fit according to, to this scheme. Okay. So we're mainly interested on, on these responses because those are responses uh, of the immune system. So the immune system of the plant responds very rapidly and then is, is able to block the fungus, okay? So the other thing is that in, in, in these two cases, you know, this one is a fully adapted uh, rice strain and this one is not, okay? However, these two are very tightly linked because both of them activate cell death. So at the end of the day, what we're interested in is, you know, a cluster of genes, okay, which are specifically regulated, you know, in these kind of uh, events, okay, where the plant is able to block the fungus very early on, okay, or, you know, a number of genes which have very different type of regulation in, in the different groups, okay? So we focused on, on some of these genes, trying to understand you know, the, their function. So the other interesting thing that there are in the database around uh, 5,000 experiments using the same AFI array. So we could use all of this information also, also to study bioinformatically, okay, how genes were co-regulated. And I will show you one example on how we use this information. So, of course, as uh, all the people do in transcriptome analysis, we looked, you know, overlaps and specificity of, uh, of you know, different types of interaction, a huge number of gene lists, which, you know, doesn't really make any sense, okay? So, anyway, we started off, anyway, trying to understand, you know, the genes which were uh, upregulated, downregulated in, in different types of interaction, and some of the genes were actually activated on, uh, uh, only on some of, the, some of these interactions. And I will show you, you know, just one example. So, this is what we call non-host, which is the innate immunity response. And this one is the host response, so when it actually the plant recognizes the fungus. Okay, so just uh, here we, we did some, uh, of course, uh, gene ontology experiments, okay, in the classification. And, you know, I just pointed out, you know, two, two interesting points. So here you see that practically in the non host response, you know, this class of genes which are self-containing defense compounds that are completely absent, okay? So that means, you know, in the host response, uh, there, were, uh, there is activation of a, a, a certain number of genes which we we can, uh, we can identify as uh, belonging to this group. On the other hand, you know, uh, you can see in the host responses, we have uh, uh, another um, group of classes, which are uh, classes, uh, something to do with secondary metabolites, okay, 
which are actually they're not um, expressed or differentially expressed at all in the host. So those were entry points for us on, on uh, trying to understand you know, which were you know, the metabolic pathways and the signal, signal transduction pathways, which were activated according to one response or the other response. So of, Q, of course, then we started using um, a software which uh, places you know, all of our uh, genes and gene functions inside metabolic pathways, okay? So I just put a, uh, one example. So here is secondary metabolites, okay? So uh, there are uh, specific genes which actually are precursors of uh, defense uh, um, proteins, okay, which are very, very well known, which are only activated uh, in, uh, in, uh, in some interactions, um, whilst they're not activated in, uh, in, uh, in, in other cases. So likewise, we have uh, cell wall modifications uh, by synthetic genes, which are, which are actually strongly downregulated in one situation and uh, actually upregulated in the other. So we started then a reconstruction, a reconstructing inside the cell uh, what was really happening, okay, and trying to really uh, focus us on on some metabolic pathways. And then we use knockout uh, mutagenesis, uh, side-directed mutagenesis uh, on the plant, uh, trying to understand how these gene family or gene families were actually affecting. And th this one is some of the, some of the ongoing, uh, ongoing work. Okay. So, of course, you know, we cannot work on 44,000 genes. So we focused on some uh, gene classes. And one of, one of these is, uh, is a class of uh, transcriptional factors that we call worky genes, okay? This one because there is this uh, worky motif, okay? Which provides specificity to the target sequence. So quite, quite well-known uh, um, transcriptional uh, factor gene family. But actually non, none, none of you, I think, knows this class of uh, transcription factors because this one is a plant-specific transcription factor, okay? So it's very interesting phylogenetically because it, it really developed only and uh, it disappeared, you know, in some, some other clades during evolution, okay? So those are quite well-known uh, transcriptional factors and they're uh, involved in, in, in a number of different responses inside of the plants to different stimuli. So uh, this, uh, this kind of gene family kind of exploded in, uh, in plants. So there are more than 100 of these genes in, uh, belonging to this gene family. So here we used uh, uh, some, two of the m most important model uh, species in, uh, in, in the plant uh, scientific community and tried to understand also uh, how these genes were organized on the phylogenetic point of view. And so we found that most, most of these genes were actually uh, belonging to mixed groups, okay? So we could find them in these two very different model species which are actually evolutionary, very distant one, one to the other, okay? But there was a group which called uh, group 3C um, of genes which were only present in rice. And actually you can see that because of these two letters, OS, whilst AT is the other model uh, species, okay? So we were very much interested because we thought that those adapted specifically to responses which were specific of rice which were not happening in the other model crop. So we, we constructed uh, a kind of whole gene family array. We really wanted to go into that because in the AFI array, not all of them were, exp were present, only something like 70% of all the genes. There are 104 genes in RISE. So we looked at the expression of these genes in, in a number of different uh, uh, conditions, okay, of course, on, upon infection, on the, on the system uh, that I just explained to you. And we started to, to, to then look, uh, we were interested on genes which were co-regulated, okay? Because we thought maybe those, of course, maybe they, they are involved you know, in the same pathways. And we find the genes which are modulated in specific conditions and they're co-regulated, maybe those genes represent you know, complex, you know, protein complexes at transcription regulation. So then we use all these uh, AFI data uh, to calculate the Pearson coefficient test, okay? Which is a, a coefficient that explains how genes uh, are co-regulating independently from, uh, 
from where they're expressed uh, and the kind of uh, stimulus. It is really to say these genes are actually uh, working together. Okay, this one is a working hypothesis. Okay, so uh, all of these work is, as I showed you from, from the phylogenetic analysis, they're divided in different clades. Okay, so one of the findings is, as we might be expecting, you know, there were early duplicated genes, okay, which are actually working together because those are early duplications and then uh, the function of those, you know, remained, you know, kind of uh, the same. But uh, if we look then at these two major groups, we call co-regulation one and co-regulation two, you can see that there are also a number of genes which are tightly co-regulated. So the thickness of these lines shows you the, the level of co-regulation. So the, the thicker is the line, the, uh, the more co-regulation we see on the system, okay? So you can see that the same colors, this one was kind of expected, but there were tight co-regulations, say for example, between these red genes and this pink gene, which was totally unexpected. So then we, we went on and we tested, you know, some functionally some of these, um, interactions by two hybrid uh, systems, okay? And we showed that they, some of these interactions were actually happening in vivo. And then according to that, we went into the, uh, into the in vivo system and we knocked out, say for example, this gene and this gene, and we found that knocking out only one of these genes, there was no phenotype. But knocking out both of them, there was a dramatic change on, for example, susceptibility to, to this fungal pathogen. So we see Nowadays, we really combine you know, bioinformatics information to gather you know, some, uh, some leads, what we call uh, leads, and then we, we go into the functional test, trying to really redirect as much as possible. So some conclusions. So we, we use whole genome uh, expression uh, data uh, from these uh, AFI experiments to try to identify signal transduction and metabolic pathways which were in, involved in innate immunity to fungal, different fungal strains. So we also uh, used the whole genome transcriptome analysis of these transcriptional factors, and we found that there were specific patterns. We identified two main co-expression working gene clusters, which were, as I mentioned, involving genes belonging to different phylogenetic clades, and now we're using this to functionally test uh, uh, the involvement of these work transcriptional factors, and so our uh, aim is really to identify the master regulators of different cellular responses. So the one which are really up there and the regulated number of responses. So if we really are, are able to modulate their expression, okay, we should be able to really have an effect on enhancing the resistance level of plants to these uh, major uh, fungal disease. So uh, the reason I'm here is that uh, Victoria and I are involved in a national project which is called Reason Nova. And uh, we studied you know, some collaborative genomics efforts to unveil the mechanisms leading to the understanding of the interaction between rice and beneficial and pathogenic bacteria and fungi. fungi. So we're now moving into trying to understand not only a single fungus, how it interacts with the plant, but it interacts with the community, which we know is present on the leaf and is also present inside the plant, okay? So this one is, is the system that, that we're using, okay? So the plant can be grown in different uh, growth conditions, okay, which are called uh, um, wetland, okay, and upland, in a sense that here there is a lot of water and here there is little water, okay? And we know that the uh, communities change very much on the two growing habits, okay? So we, we, we collected, you know, a number of samples, you know, from different uh, parts of the plant, mainly focusing on the, on the roots system because this one is the most important one for plant growth. And then, uh, as, I, as we indicated here, we're, we're taking in some of the metagenomics approach to try to understand and pinpoint very important uh, components of these microbial communities and also trying to understand the interaction with pathogenic and uh, uh, beneficial microorganisms interacting with the rice plant. So, uh, of course, a, a number of uh, collaborative projects uh, with uh, different institutions in, in Italy and uh, in Europe and also outside uh, Europe. If you're interested to have more details, here's the website of our rationomics group. And uh, I will stop here and uh, take any question. Thanks.